through God, uh, Yah, Yahovah, um, whatever you feel like you would feel better talking. The last time we talked about the importance, and this was really powerful, some of y'all missed this, the understanding that we have been adopted in the faith. And I tell people really, if you really want to experience God's grace, grab a hold of this. It's not that just we've been saved, praise God, right? Needed grace for that. But that we've been brought in to be co-heirs. I mean, do you understand the significance of that? And I wanted to say that because as we move forward uh, this afternoon or today, it's really important that as a body we grab a hold of this, that every person who looks towards Messiah, who's repented of their sin, confesses Him as Lord and Savior, you are being brought in to another family. And you're now not an orphan, you are now adopted. But here's the catch that we see within typical Christianity. We still live like orphans. We do not live a life found in Messiah and adopted under what? Under new rules, right? If I'm adopted into a family, if I adopt a young son or a young daughter, they're not going to take, a matter of fact, they take my name, don't they? So not only do they take my name, but also they're no longer, I'm not going to let them live like they did like where they were, when they were in an orphanage. Scrapping for food, wanting to know if they're loved, wanting to know if they're accepted. No, in my home, when I adopt them in, they will know who they are. But they're not going to live under the rules of the orphanage. What are they going to do? They're going to live now under the rules of being, what's it mean to be a scan, right? And for you and for us, it's learning to live a life that pleases the Father and not a life That pleases our old flesh as orphans. So I want you to make sure we understand this. With adoption comes all the rights and privileges bestowed upon sons and daughters. Matter of fact, it's the same rights that a biological son or daughter have. And in many states, uh, you know, just kind of the natural realm here for a minute. In many states, the adopted son or daughter have more rights than even the biological parents. Did you all know that? Or the biological uh, sons and daughters. Powerful. And I think inside this statement of what we're learning, I think you'll, you'll grab a hold of it. It's powerful if you'll allow it to change your thinking that you are not just some, you know, I know that we've heard this before. I mean, if you grew up in the church, you know, uh, just an old sinner saved by grace. That's all I am. Just, no, you're an adopted son and daughter. The name of Yahovah is on you. Yeshua dwells in you, empowers you by the Ruach HaKadosh, right? We need the Spirit of God. Because without the Spirit of God, we just become a bunch of religious people who obey rules for whatever reason. Yet many in the body of Messiah still live their lives scrambling for an identity, struggling with these orphan-like issues instead of living a new, under their new adopted family, the uh, the family of the Father. Romans chapter 8, 14 and 15 says it like this. It says, for all who are led by the Ruach Elohim, these are sons of God. You want to know the evidence of a, of a follower, someone that's been adopted, is that they're being led by the Spirit. They're not led by the flesh. They're not led by their old carnal thinking. They're led now by a new thinking. Why? Because God's Ruach, His Spirit, is indwelling His people, leading and guiding and instructing. In verse 15, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery, or you can take that word slavery and just add adopted or an orphan. To fall again into fear, powerful, rather you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And, and really that's uh, depending on how you study it out, but in the Aramaic, that word Abba is a be- beautiful word, beautiful word, because they don't have in the Hebrew and the Arabic this word for daddy, but the relationship that's being conveyed in that passage of Scripture is that. It's not just like father, oh, you know, wait until you get home, your father's going to whoop you. How many of y'all got one of them, right? Praise God, right? Wait until your father gets home, right? That's not what's happening here. It's daddy. It's that you get to sit on the front porch and you sit with him as a daughter sits with her father and gets love and instruction and guidance for their life. It's a relational word. You've been made into this relationship completely powerful. You are not a slave to the world. You receive the spirit of adoption. You're under a new set of rules, i.e. the Torah, which guides us and instructs us and helps us. It's not legalism when you understand the Torah is about one, one thing and one thing only, and that is love. 
when you understand that Torah is about God's love for his people and how we demonstrate love back to the Father through this relationship. We know that whomever you are a slave to, the Bible says, that is whom you will serve. I.e., if you still live by the world's system, orphans, then you'll live without hope. And you're a slave to it. But the other is also true. If when you serve the one who has adopted you, you're no longer a slave, but you become an heir. I'm preaching better than y'all are talking to me. Come on, somebody. Thank you. I don't know where I'm at in my notes. I'm going, I've got two sets of notes here, right? I'm like, you know, praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. So we want to kick back into our message as we flow through this, uh, this, this Galatians 4, looking and beginning today. I want you to have this understanding. As we walk through today, I want you to understand and remember that you've been adopted. So the whole conversation that we have today, you'll understand this. It'll help you grasp where we're going today. Because we're going to get into, believe it or not, we might get a little deep today. Amen. Galatians chapter 4, verse 8. It says, but at that time, what time? God's appointed time. When you did not know God, you served those who by nature are not gods at all. Now, I want you to notice what Paul begins to do. He's going to make this thing, as always, Paul is Paul. He's probably in the New Testament, I've said this before, in comparison to Solomon, he's probably one of the wisest guys that ever lived within the Scriptures, other than Yeshua. Very smart, very wise. I mean, he grew up understanding Torah uh, very intelligent. That's why Paul or Peter in First Peter chapter two, I believe it's around twenty twenty one, said that uh, Peter's te- or Paul's teachings were hard to understand, and that you need to be put on guard because unless people come in and do what twist it to fit their agenda, and we've seen that happen. But Paul's super intelligent, so what he's going to do here is he's going to make this super practical. Reminding them, the Gentile, the Galatians, they were and what they served prior to coming to Messiah. Who they were. What they served. They served and worshipped false gods made by the hands of men. Look at Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 11. Look at what, what it says. It says, has a nation changed its gods? Even though they are not gods, yet my people have exchanged their glory for what? Worthless things. I want to ask you a question. Don't answer. That's a, um, uh, yeah, just, just hear, hear the question. And just think about it inside you. I want you to think about this. Do we still do that today? Are we exchanging the things of God's glory for worthless things? Notice what they're doing. They're trying to be circumcised. This is a whole letter of Galatians. Is this idea and understanding of circumcision. And Paul's telling them, you're changing out things for worthless things. You're exchanging what what God has done in your life, what what, what He has seen God do, and exchanging it for something very worthless. And what is it? It's circumcision. They had a pattern of behavior and grabbing on to inventions of their own minds, much like what we see today. We too need this reminder as us as the body of Messiah. As a community, we need to hear this. Who are you? Who were you prior to Mashiach? Who were you prior to the Messiah? Who? What did your life look like? And here's the thing: if all you have done, uh, I tell about this when we talk about uh, sometimes freedom. If all you've done, if, if you would imagine for a moment that all of us are sin because of Adam and Eve biting out of the tree or taking of the tree in the center of the garden, right? And the tree in the garden, obviously, one of the trees in the garden, obviously, was the tree of knowledge. And if, you are, if, if all you're doing is coming into church, I'm going to use the church quote, and you're still the same person, but you're trying to better your behavior, all you've done is change limbs on the same tree. In other words, you're still about knowledge. You're still about trying to make yourself a little bit better, right? Instead of changing trees, which is the tree of eternal life. And that's really what they should have done, but they didn't. Because of deception. We see that happening in, um, in today's churches, in today's families, much like we see today. But before coming to the truth, we were all led astray, serving gods who were not really gods. Think about it. We served ourselves. I was talking to somebody the other day. I said the number one god that people serve today is the selfie. The self. 
from YouTube to, man, all social media, man, it's addicting. It's a, uh, there's just a spirit there that completely distracts you from being who God's called you to be. Paul is again letting us know who they were before Messiah came. And he reminds them in that passage of what they should. Verse 9 goes on to say, but now, now we're believers, right? But now you've come to know God. Or rather, it's not even that. It says you have come to be known by God. I love that statement because here's a misunderstanding. If the Bible says no man cometh unto the Father, unless what? The spirit of Adonai draweth them. You don't get saved because you woke up one morning and said, you know, I've got to change my life. I think I'll just... It's because God's drawing you. You were known by Him and He drew you in. So how can you turn back again to those weak and worthless principles? Do you want to be enslaved to them all over again? Think about that for a minute. Do you want to go back in the world? Do you want to go and live that life that the end result was death? Paul is reminding these Galatians, man, why are you going into these human elements again? Why are you trying to do things by your own effort, your own energy, your own strength? You can't do it. You have to do something different in your walk. You have to, and that is faith. You have to trust in Messiah. Notice the language he uses, though, in this question. Notice what he says. How can you turn back? I want you to feel the weight of the question that he's asking these, gen- these Galatians. I mean, he discipled these. He started this community. And remember now, Galatia is not just a church. It's a series of churches in the province of Galatia, uh, right around um, ter- now modern-day Turkey. He's not talking to just a church. He's talking to churches that he had established, communities that he had created that God used him to start, and now he's going back to them, and he's giving them some weighty questions. How in the world can you go back? Don't mistake this. He is referring to them turning on things that have no profit, worthless, of no value, things that make no difference to the flesh and have no spiritual value whatsoever. The question is, what was it that they were observing or doing that had no profit? What is it that was weak and worthless? Well, let's look at our verse that we're going to hang out on this verse for a little bit. Galatians chapter 4, verse 10. Let's let's look at this. Paul speaking again. You observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid that I've poured out labor over in vain. Now we're going to hang out on this this verse because there is no possible way for us to understand this verse in just a 10 or 15 minute message. Because this message, what you're going to see, this passage, Galatians 4.10, has wrecked the Christian world. And I'm going to show you that. I'm going to show you how far back it goes. It is just crazy how one verse will turn humanity upside down. And we're going to see it today. It is powerful. I don't know what you, you might be saying. Well, Pastor Mike, you've showed us a lot of verses that kind of jack. But yeah, I know, right? When you get into Galatians, it just does that. But this is the verse, man, that I cannot even give enough time to today. There's no way. And this is what's going to hang us up. This is it. This is what is weak and worthless. They were observing days and months and seasons and years that had no value. They were worthless. They were weak. Now, before we get too deep into this, I want us to remember that the overall shadow of this letter is about salvation by circumcision. Works. That the Pharisees and religious scholars had infiltrated the believers in Galatia, the Gentiles, and told them that they were not really in yet. They really weren't part of the family yet unless they took on a physical, by hand, fleshly circumcision. This is where the deception begins. Matter of fact, you go back to Galatians chapter 1, or I think it's 2, and it says, Who bewitched you when you started out in faith, but now have turned to the things of the flesh? And they told them they were not really in. So unless they had been circumcised in the flesh, but something else we need to know about those that came in is that they didn't just say that they need to be circumcised. They also left a residue of other teachings that we have to address today. Powerful. Now, looking at the text, it would appear from this verse that Paul was against any observance of the essential laws of the Mosaic Torah involving the days, the months, the times, the season, and the years. Matter of fact, 
when you get into a debate with a, a believer who is not Torah observant, they will reference, didn't, don't we have to, Paul got on to the Gentiles about observing the season times. Yeah, but let's not misunderstand it, okay? So let's, let's unpack it today so that you'll have clarity and understand what Paul was saying to the Galatians. Looking at the text again, it's really easy to think that he's telling us not to do the feast days and the Sabbath. As a matter of fact, most will believe that what is Paul's referencing here. And it's not new. Matter of fact, it's been a thought that's been brought into the ch- from all church history. All church history has dealt with this passage of Scripture somewhere, somehow. It's a false teaching, a false belief that's out there. And we've got to come to terms and realize, man, we've got to start. Listen, church, you've got to start reading this thing. And not just reading it from the eyes of your, your grandpa who was a pastor. And, you know, no offense there, okay? But, but you got to read it from the mind and the eyes of Messiah. And wondering, what were they saying? What was really going on? It's not, one, it's not two stories. It's one story. See, at first glance, it would appear that Paul was against the observance of these essential laws of the Torah. But was this really the thrust of his words? Anyone doing an honest reading and an honest thought throughout the, book, the whole book of Galatians, if you just did this on your own context, you would have to return with an answer of absolutely no. That's not what he's referring to. But I want you to see this, and this thought is not new to us today. But even in the early Christian thought. So what we're going to do is we're going to, as we've been doing, we're going to do a little history, okay? We've got to understand how we got to this place to understand the truth of what's being spoken. The epistle of Ignatius to the Magnesians. Uh, this epistle um, is attributed to Ignatius of Antioch. He's a second century bishop. I don't even like the word bishop because it references to another church, okay? Of Antioch and addressed to the church in Magnesia, on the meander, and it was written during Agnesius' travel to be executed. That's something maybe we should have paid attention to. So let's look at what he says. And remember, this is way back in the first century. It says, Let us therefore no longer keep the Sabbath after the Jewish manner and rejoice in the days of idleness. Can we get that brought up, please? Thank you. Let us therefore no longer keep the Sabbath after the Jewish manner and rejoice in the days of idleness, for he who does not work does not eat. Ignatius to the Magnesians. Now you'd go, well, where's this, where's this come from? Well, it absolutely got, he got this from Galatians 4.10 through false interpretation again. Remember, he is a bishop. Very important that you understand that. We get statements like this come out of Galatians 4.10 constantly. This is the great divide that has been passed down from generation to generation. And I want us to see how this has damaged the body of Messiah. Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Pentecost, Day of Atonement, all of them are of uh, Jewish descent. But we know, right, because we've read our Bibles, that they, are not, they don't belong to the Jewish people. Amen. They don't belong to them. Read your Bible, Leviticus 29, these are God's feasts belonging to the house of Israel. But the Lord used the Jewish people to guard them and protect them so that in one time we can be revealed like we're seeing today in the modern, uh, all over the world. It's, it's just amazing to see what God's doing. We've been separated from, this, from them and this great divide that was created as back as the latest first century, that's when this was written. But, but let's not just look at the first century, let's bump forward a little bit, and let's look at the Council of Laodicea. This is a council you need to study. There's two councils, I think, that a Christian needs to study. The first council is the Council of Nicaea, 364. This is, where the, this is where the division first happened, under the rulership or the observance, or however you want to call it, of Constantine, of Constantinople. But the second one is the Council of Laodicea. The Council of Laodicea, it is what lays out how the church in that time frame, 4th century, is to function, how they're to live. Wh- who's going to be the boss? What are we going to do? Are we, how are we going to worship? They made all the rules that technically today, many, many churches won't admit it, but they're fa- following the exact Council of Laodicea. They're doing everything there. 
They're, they brought in this stuff. Now, I want to look at some of these. These things are called canons, these laws or rules that the Council of Laodicea passed to govern the church, and to this day, they govern the Catholic church. Let's look at canon number 37. It is not lawful to receive portions sent from the feast of Jews or heretics. Notice how they, where they group the Jewish people. Or to feast together with them. What are they talking about? They're talking about the feast. They're talking about um, uh, the feast of trumpets and t- or tabernacles, right? And we shouldn't do that. It's unlawful to receive the portions that were sent from there. That's not enough. Let's look at Canon 38. It is not lawful to receive unleavened bread from the Jewish people. What are they referring to? Passover. Nor to be partakers of their impiety. Their, their structure, their religion, their their way of doing things. And who can forget the famous Canon 29? This one you should know. Every believer in the body of Messiah should know this one because this is what got us to where we are today. Canon 29. Christians must not judaize by resting on the Sabbath or the Shabbat, but must work on that day rather honoring the Lord's day. Hold that for a minute. Don't flip over. They take one passage of Scripture in the Bible that dealt with the Lord's day. One. And they change the entire commandment of the fourth commandment. Continuing on. And if they can, can, resting then as Christians. Watch what happens. But if any shall be found to be Judaizers, in other words, honoring the Sabbath, let them be anathema from Christ. In other words, let them be excommunicated. Now I want you to get this in your picture for a little church history for you. Imagine this being the the dictate of the region that you live in. That you would be excommunicated from the church. But that's not enough. Because for the next hundred or so years, persecution is going to come. And it's not just going to be, oh, you're out of the church. It's going to be, we're going to kill you. We're going to not just excommunicate you. And so then as what has happened over the hundreds of years, this persecution continues to happen. And then we end up with the church that we have today where we're completely separated from the roots of our faith. So we have to understand this foundation in order to move forward into the faith, into who God is calling us to be. So for those of you who are new, these canons were created in the 4th century to guide the church and how it was to operate separate from the Jewish people. Today is what governs the Catholic Church. Now, let's continue on there because there's another one that I want to give. It's in the 6th century, and this is in the Valsagothic profession. Valsagothic, which is an amazing uh, study that I did, is these are kind of Jewish people, kind of not. They're kind of a mixed group, but they were in uh, kind of modern-day Rome, and they wanted to be in Rome, but the problem with it was they didn't agree spiritually. So this Valsagothic profession, they come in and say, these are the things we swear that we will do in order that we can walk in agreement. Watch what they say. Go ahead and bring that up. This is an interesting quote. We will not practice carnal circumcision. Can you imagine a Jewish person saying that? Or celebrate Passover, the Sabbath, or the other feast days connected with the Jewish religion. So for hundreds of years, this ideology had been passed down and trickled down a little here, a little there, to where now we see a movement that's happening within the world and people are coming back to the roots of their faith. Very prophetic, by the way, what we're seeing, what we're seeing the Father do in the people. Again, this is all about Galatians 4.10. But let's look at some others. All right, let's look at, let me see, where am I at here? I got this up there. Yeah. Uh, some of the Jews, do, 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 do. where are we at here? Is this the, oh, yeah, 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 wonderful. Some of the Jews who believe being held down, by, okay, do I, did I miss a passage? I think I did. Ah, here we go, all right. So I want us to review a little bit as to familiarize ourselves from the first week of our series, and this is critical for us to understand what's happening. Remember that Paul is not just referencing the law, as in the Mosaic law, but he's also referencing, uh, he's doing exactly what the Messiah did what he did with the Pharisees. See, Paul isn't just going to come against, when we see the word, we, can, we kind of tend to see law and Torah and all this kind of myth. But you got to understand that, that Messiah and Paul contended with the same issue, man-made laws. 
Man-made religion, man-made rules. Remember the oral law, the spoken law that was, governed, that was created. It had good intentions, and the intention was to insulate God's commandments. But the problem was they threw God's commandments out, and they begin to honor the oral law above these things. Well, we see some of this in, uh, when we look at the church history. So I want to I remember a quote from John uh, Christotham. Uh, it's a powerful quote we're dealing with the same thing. So it says, some of the Jews who believed being held down, this is on the book of Galatians, held down by the possession of Judaism, I'm going to knock that over, and at the same time intoxicated by vainglory, um, and desirous in obtaining for themselves the dignity of teachers, came to the Galatians and taught them that the observance of circumcision, Sabbath, uh, new moons, was necessary, and that Paul is abolishing these things was not to be born. Understanding, did Paul, think about this educated people, did Paul ever abolish the Sabbath, the feast? No. But this is the teaching that's being brought down into, this, is, uh, this was a, uh, a commentary on the book of Galatians, written in the 1800s. But it's being passed down from one generation to another generation to another generation, and it continues to go on. Again, it's based off of Galatians 4.10 because of a misunderstanding. Yes, circumcision was an issue. But what else? It says you observe that passage in Galatians 4.10. You observe days, months, and years. Considering the impact that this verse has had on the church and our history, it could not give, we can't give it enough time this morning to talk about it. There's no possible way. However, the question still remains. What was Paul talking about? And I wish I could just give you the answer right now. But you know, Pastor Mike, you ain't going to do that. That's too easy. Then you go home, you, you miss Oneg, all that. So before we get into this, though, I want all of us to think about something. Not just the impact that this one verse has made over Christendom, but I need you to consider something. If you accept what we have stated on these quotes and all this stuff, and what has been passed down as truth, then you're going to have a couple of major problems. All right? I want you to think about this. The first problem you're going to have, and you need to ask the question, is did Yeshua teach against these things? Did Yeshua teach against the Sabbath and the feasts? Matter of fact, no. Matter of fact, contradicting that, when you go through and you study the life of Messiah, you'll see that he participated in them. Second, it does not go with the rest of Scripture. This is a big one. If you'll remember that when reading the Bible or understanding it, the Bible is cohesive. The Bible is continuous. The Bible flows together. It's not in odds with each other. It runs together. And there's books that, yes, they are missing some books that I think we're, the church would do well to begin to read those as well. But to have a healthy balance, exegesis. Exegesis is when you look at a passage of Scripture and you literally look at it and you, you interpret it for what it says. Without your input, without your commentary, you simply look at the Bible in exegesis form. To do that, to understand that, you have to have consistency within the rest of Scripture. It's the cornerstone of biblical interpretation. I truly believe... This is why so many get it wrong. They try to make something fit scriptures into their belief or whatever it is that they may be teaching. And what they do is that rather than exegesis and read scripture in context, what they do is they pull it out of context, what we call the cherry pickers, and they take just little bits of conversations out of it and try to make it fit their dogma. The problem with that is it will not stand the test of time. And yes, we'll say, well, Pastor Mike, it has its time. Yeah, it has up to a season until the Lord has opened the eyes of the church. And they are awakening. Understand this, that when you and I read Scripture and you think it means this, you must step back and look at the totality of Scripture and see if it aligns with that idea of what you're teaching. You understand that? So when you come and you read a passage, you know, I've heard this statement say, and it's just, this statement, in my opinion, okay, this is Pastor Mike, okay, just my opinion, all right? This is one of the most misused and misguided statements that I've heard in the body of Messiah. And it's something like this. Well, you know, I love reading the Bible, and, and you'll read the Bible with someone, and they go, well, you'll get your interpretation, and then I get my interpretation, and, you know, and God uses it a different way, and you're going to see the Bible different. No! 
It is the same Spirit that wrote this Bible that is supposed to be inside the heart of a believer. There is not going to be your interpretation and my interpretation and God's interpretation. There is going to be God's interpretation. And the Spirit that dwells within the heart of mankind, the stamp that's been given to you as a believer, will confirm His Word. This lie that's been spoken by the enemy, that you can have your own interpretation of what Scripture means, man, that is balarky, man. It's garbage. Because Scripture aligns to Scripture. The Spirit will bring confirmation to these things. It's an excuse that we've used because we don't understand. It's, it's an excuse that we've used because there are people, unfortunately, in the pulpit that preach from these that are not filled with the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, probably don't even have a relationship with Messiah. They're great businessmen, but they're horrible pastors. I can't believe I said that. See, a perfect example of this is if you celebrated with us just a week or so ago, we celebrated the Feast of Sukkot. It's a great example of this. But I want you to read some, oh, No, let me, let me look at it and show you a different example. A perfect example here, what Paul's doing, and we read this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. Look at what it says. Get rid of the old hamats. What is hamats? Well, it's the Hebrew word for what? Leavened or yeast, right, leavened or yeast. What is it actually representing in this passage? Sin. Not too difficult, right? Oh, but Pastor Mike, we're not supposed to celebrate Passover. Okay, let's look at what Paul said to the Galatians. So you may be a new batch, a new creation, just as you are unleavened, for Messiah, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Now, therefore, let us celebrate what? The feast. Not with old hamats, in other words, with sin, the hamatz of malice and wickedness, but with unleavened bread, the matzah of sincerity and truth. In other words, with a new spirit, right? Things passed down that we handle. We, look at, we, we like to overlook those passages, don't we? We don't want to look at those. Wait, wait, we're supposed to celebrate Passover? Paul commanded it. Got to come back to truth. Notice again who Paul is speaking to in Corinthians, can I tell you, he's not speaking to Jewish people. He was speaking to the Gentiles. Here's my point. Paul cannot be telling the Galatians that they should be keeping the feast, all the while telling the Corinthians not to, or to, to keep the feast. So he can't be telling the, the Galatians, you're not supposed to do it, but tell the Corinthians that you're supposed to do it. Here's the problem with that. Remember, we talk about Scripture has to match Scripture. This would be a complete contradiction to the teachings of Paul. And if Paul has one contradiction in here, in this book, then where else could there be a contradiction? Then we must take the two-thirds of the entire New Testament and throw it away. Because it's no longer valid as truth. Get this, guys, in your spirit. It's time for the body of Messiah to awaken. Moreover, if you look at Matthew, I love this. Matthew 8, 10 through 12. I didn't put the scripture up there, but look at this on your own. Where he specifically, Messiah specifically talks to, uh, he says that many will come from the east and the west to do what? To recline. Which reclining, how many of y'all seen the picture? Come on, how many of y'all see Jesus in the middle, the Last Supper, everybody's reclining. Well, when did you recline? What holiday, what feast are you supposed to recline at? Passover Seder. And Messiah says in, in Matthew chapter 8 and 10 through 12, he says that many will recline a reference to Passover, with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. We're not just going to keep the Passover for this age, but it's a prophetic message that Passover will be celebrated in the age to come. So those of you who are having a problem with Passover, you're really going to... Thank you. You're really going to have a, a problem in the age to come. It's okay. They, they got it. Look up here. <laughs> Now, unless you simply choose to ignore the facts and ignore a great portion of Scripture, Paul is not telling the Galatians not to celebrate the feast. So what about Shabbat, though? Does Paul tell us in Galatians 4.10 we're not to keep the Sabbath? Well, let's look at what the rest of the Bible says. Did you know that in the New Testament per page, great study, that the Shabbat or Sabbath is mentioned more times in the New Testament than the entirety of the Tanakh, the New Testament, or the Old Testament? The Tanakh being the, the Torah, the prophets, and the writings, the letters. That's powerful. 
we see Messiah. And every time we see Messiah, what was his custom in the book of Luke? His custom was going to the temple on Sabbath. Our example, the Messiah, is our example. We look at it and see it in the book of Acts as they continued in the temple and meeting together when? On Shabbat. It matches Scripture. Let's not forget what the Father said through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 56, one of my favorite all-time passages. He says in just a portion, this would be great reading for you, next step reading, is read the entirety of Isaiah 56. For he says, I will give to them in my house and within my walls a memorial and a name, watch this, better than the sons and daughters, referencing to those of the immediate house of Israel. I'll give them an everlasting name that will not be cut off. Verse 6, powerful. Also, the foreigner who joins themselves to Adonai to minister to him and to what? Love the name of Adonai and to be his servant. All who keep from profaning Shabbat and hold fast to my covenant. What will happen? These I will bring to my holy mountain and let them rejoice in my house of prayer. What is he referencing to? Salvation. Salvation. Those who will honor the name of the Father, who say, I love God, then you honor God, you love God by what? Honoring His Sabbath. What else will He do? Well, their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all what? Nations. You all understand that when nations is written within the Hebrew Scriptures, you know what they're referencing to? The Gentiles. Powerful. Powerful stuff. We have to stop trying to interpret Paul through the eyes of what we want the Bible to say. And instead begin to see it the way the Father has given it to us. This is talking about eternal life. If you go back and read the first part, what you'll see is the foreigners are not to say that I'm cut off or I'm excluded from his people. Did I just lose my battery? Did I just lose my battery on that? Let me have another mic, please. For our online people. I've got lights on. You turn me off up there. There we go. You working on it? Check one, two. Can I have a mic, please? Nobody noticed the, uh, the sound guy until the sound goes awry. Huh? <laughs> Check one, two, one, two. Can we go? It? I'll just preach, man. Yeah, just keep going? Okay. Fortunately, oh. Well, there we go. How are you today? Okay, praise God. We have to, stop, to uh, stop trying to interpret Paul through the eyes of what we want the Bible to say and instead begin to see him or see it in the way the Father has given it to us. This is talking about eternal life again. Galate, looking at this, Galatians 4.10, this is the culprit for so many things within the body of Messiah that brings so much false teaching. Galatians 4.10 again, you ab- in months and seasons and years. We cannot possibly interpret this the way it's being sold to us. No matter who or how long it's been given, however, we still have an issue. Again, my question that I've already posed once before, I know you're just on the edge of your seat. What is Paul really trying to say? Well, let's look at a couple of commentaries. I love this. I'm not like a full supporter of commentaries. I do look at commentaries for reference, uh, and I want, I want you to see this, this commentary. Let's look at this one. This is the whole meaning of the verse. This is talking about this 410 verse in Galatia. The whole meaning of the verse depends on the sense attached to this word. It's compounded of a verb which means to observe and a preposition which implies that either the purpose or the method of observation is bad. This is put out by the Cambridge Bible. Go back and hold that right there. This This is about the Cambridge Bible for schools and colleges. This is not a messianic commentary. This is not a Jewish commentary. I want you to get this this morning. What I'm about to read you is a Gentile commentary used in colleges. It continues. St. Paul is not condemning the observance of days and months and times and years, but their misobservance, Cambridge Bible for schools. Compare this. Hang on. We're going to go back to that Colossians here in a second. Have we got the sound figured out yet? All right, let's just, let's just hold it right there for now and just let this go. All right, we'll do that. 
and uh, and we'll work it, worry about it later. All right. So this this is super powerful. If you look at the verse from the Greek, the term "you observe" is done in a very. Listen to me. This is this is good Greekage. Okay. Like, like, I, I've had pastors say, well, why do you teach Greek and Hebrew? You know, nobody cares. Yes, they do. You know what they're telling their congregation? Their congregation isn't smart enough to get it. I love Greek and Hebrew because it brings clarity to what the passage says. Now, when this word uh, is used, you observe, it's typically, this, in this passage, it's done in a negative, in a negative sense. Basically, Paul is telling the Galatians, you're in big trouble. We got to deal with some stuff. It's kind of like dad got home and you didn't mind mama, and you fitting to get Y'all know the rest of that, right? Praise God. Okay. Now watch, though. Generally speaking, when this phrase is used within the Greek, it's used in a positive sense. Other than right here in this text. This is big. Now watch. It goes on to say, St. Paul's not condemning the observance of days and months and times and years, but what? Their misobservance of it. Something was going on within the Galatian church, the community of Galatia, that Paul looked at and said, that's not right. we got to find out what it is. Paul is not condemning them from the observance of the days, months, times, and years. No, but how they're celebrating them. There's something that they're doing related to these times that is causing Paul to bring down the rod of correction. It's powerful. It goes on to say, what is Paul really saying here? Let's look. Now, compare Colossians, go ahead and do the next, thank you, Colossians 2.16, where not the simple observance is condemned, but the slavery which is involved in its being required for salvation, and the dishonor which is done to Christ by adding to his perfect righteousness. Hold that for just a moment. We cannot make this more clear. It is the slavery to observe these feasts as a requirement for what? What's the original idea and what's the original argument that Paul is dealing with in the whole book of Galatia? Salvation, works by salvation. The Galatians come in, or the Pharisees, the Sadducees come in, and what do they tell them? They don't only tell them that you have to be circumcised to be in Messiah, that if you don't follow these, uh, these feasts the correct way, you're not a Christian. That in order to be saved, you had to, or it's all about the works. It's all about the works that he's referencing. This is powerful. It gets even better. Now, again, as I said earlier, that this is, uh, where am I at? Let me, yes, let's go ahead and go into that next point. Let's go ahead and do that. There is clearly no exemption here from the obligation of the observance of the seventh day, the law of the Sabbath. Now, he's going to go into talking about where you see, we see the misnomer that's happening today, where the Sunday and the Sabbath. I didn't say he was perfect, but he's on point on this portion, okay? And I want to, I want to make sure you understand that if we go into that next page. I.e., of one weekly day of holy rest in God, uh, the seventh in the Jewish, the first in the Christian. This is where he misses it is as old as a Christian. Now, watch this. It is founded on the moral and physical constitution of man. I want you to get that in your spirit. It is founded inside us. It was instituted in paradise and incorporated in the Decalogue on Mount Sinai in the commands of God. This is powerful. Put on a new foundation by the resurrection of Messiah and is an absolute, watch this, this is, a, this is a Gentile commentary. It is an absolute necessity for public worship and the welfare of man. Uh, we were talking in the video, it says that part of worship is giving. Part of worship is attending Sabbath and being a part of a Sabbath service. And I know this may break some people's hearts that are either here or watching me. We're moving to a Sabbath. If you didn't pick that up, it's happening. Let me just break the, let me just get out there and what is it that you, Pastor Dustin, what do you think? Pull that Band-Aid off, right? We are moving to a Sabbath. Prepare your heart. I don't understand why we are okay with breaking, not breaking nine of the commandments, but we're okay with breaking one of them. Why? This is institute, it's in our spirit. You can't get away from it. It's part of how we were, where we created. Now i got to find out where I'm at. Praise the Lord. I just get to preaching now. Praise God. Okay. Uh, let's see here. This is the Christian commentary, not Jewish. Okay, we already said that. Now, here comes the grand finale. Watch this grand finale, right? 
What St. Paul condemns is the observance of the day in a legal spirit in compliance with the minute and the childish prohibitions of what? The rabbinic system and as a matter of merit with God. This is what we teach at our church. Here's the underlying foundation of our belief system here at Epic Life. We believe that salvation is by faith through grace alone. You can't earn it. But we believe this. Once you become a follower of Messiah, because you are a follower of Messiah, your salvation was earned not by your works. The natural inclination of the Spirit is to follow Messiah, and that includes the Torah. We don't gain that by right. You can be Jewish. You can be 100% Jewish in our church today. Guess what? You're not going to heaven. We talked about that. It's not about your bloodline. It's about faith in Messiah. You understand that? You can be, you can like, you can be so traditional and celebrate all of the the mitzvahs. You can do it all perfectly and not have a relation with Messiah, and you will burn in hell. I know that's hard language, right? Come on now. Hopefully you're used to that by now. The bottom line is we follow the Torah not for salvation, but because we are saved. And because it's God's standard of demonstrating real love to our neighbor and to him first. Amen? All right, moving along. That that was a soapbox. I'm off it now. Okay, come on. If you really want to get technical, Christians have been doing this exact same thing. They've been doing exactly what Paul is coming against. Now, I'm going to step on your feet. If you were here at Sukkot, you already prepared for it, okay? But if you weren't, get your feet ready. It's going to hurt. Because we've been adopted into this family of Mashiach, not by our merit or our observation, but by his grace and faithfulness, the Galatians, the Galatians were adopting a system that Yeshua destroyed on the cross, and it's the same system that Paul is now condemning, and that is salvation by works. Now, again, the technicality here is that Christians are doing this exact same thing even right now. You want to prove it? I know this is going to hurt, all right? You know when your daddy used to spank you? He said, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. This is probably how that's going to feel. Because there are many of us in this body of Messiah today who still celebrate Christmas. And that's not in the Bible. There are many in the body of Messiah who still celebrate Easter. That's not written in the Bible. There are many in the body of Messiah that we, we do the Holy Communion and all that stuff. Right? Do you know that was a direct pass down from the Catholic Church? Matter of fact, outside probably our song and our worship type service, many of the things that the traditional Christian church celebrate come directly out of the Catholic church. Traditions passed down from time and time and time again. And by goodness, if we won't protect those traditions, will we? We'll guard those traditions and we'll let go and we'll negate God's word and the commandments that he has written to us. And we don't understand why we're not seeing the power of God move, why we're not seeing miracles and people delivered and set free. God cannot bless. I want you to hear this. This is free this morning. God cannot bless disobedience, and he never has. And just because you see a church that's filled with hype and they say things like, oh, God sure moved that day, did he? Well, because you felt the emotion? Because they played your favorite song? Were you set free? Are you still living in the same bondage you were before you came to church? Are you still legalistic? Are you still religious? All of those things pass down. But when you begin to look at Torah as your source, things begin to change. This has been crazy how this stuff has been passed down from generation to generation to generation. These traditions that Paul and Yeshua went against, all of which are traditions not based on Scripture or commanded by the Father. Now, does that mean you're, you're not a Christian if you celebrate Christmas? No, I don't, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that we'll fight, the, we'll, 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 we'll fight tooth and nail to protect that. But then when I show you Scripture in the Bible, Leviticus 29, Leviticus 11, and show you what God has commanded, oh, we've got to find a reason not to talk about that. We, yeah, that's, that was for the Jewish people. But yet, that statement for the Jewish people is never in Scripture. We've got to get a hold of this, man. This will set you free to live the life that God has created for you to live. Galatians 4, 9, verse 10, you observe days and months and seasons, years, and I fear for you that perhaps I have labored for you in vain. Why? Because he introduced grace to them. 
He introduced Messiah to them. And they went back to say, you know what? We're going to try to earn our salvation. We still do it today. We still do it today. So now you can see Paul's disappointment in verse 11. And how he feels that this labor was done in vain. Now, I want to give you a little bit more clarity And I want to look at Colossians for a minute. We have to give you this before we go. I know, listen, just sit back, relax, and enjoy the the message because it just gets better. It just gets better. Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. Let's look at this. This is what Paul was referenced. Therefore, or the commentary, therefore do not let anyone, say anyone, pass judgment on you in matters of food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new Shabbat. Now, it's easy to look at this passage and go, oh, there it goes, right there, because they've used it before, but don't be misguided, because that's not what he's talking about. Watch what Colossians 2.17 says. These are foreshadowing of things to come, but the reality is Messiah. In other words, all of this one thing we teach all about these, these feasts that we celebrate, the fall feasts we just came out of, they all point to Messiah, and they're prophetic. Not pathetic, come on, somebody. They're prophetic. They're telling you what's fixing to happen. Oh, this, oh, my goodness. Come on, brother. My old, my old preacher coming out of me. Now, look. So the same language as our text in 2.16, it's the same language that we see in the book of uh, uh, Galatians. It says, you know, passing judgments on the matter of food or drink. It's the same language. Now, remember what Paul, that Paul is an expert in the Tanakh. Matter of fact, if you go back and look at numbers and you go back, he, he words it exactly the same thing about the thief and the new moons, and the days and the years. He, he does it, he's so good. And you'll see that he lays out the same order and the same verbiage as the Tanakh. It's important to us also to understand why Paul is making this statement to the Colossians. Because think about this. Do you know where Colossae is? Oh, man, this is so good. Can you bring that scripture up just one more time just to look at it? 2.16, come on. This is so good. When you know your church history, it's beautiful. Colossae is in the smack dab middle of Turkey, and it is a trade route. It's the main trade route for the Roman Empire. Guess who the church of Colossae was surrounded with and by? Pagans. Guess who they were under persecution by? Pagans. Paul is telling the Colossian church, don't let them judge you. Don't let them persecute you because of the Sabbath that you're keeping, because of the feast that you celebrate. It goes on. This is, it gets so much better. Verse 17 continues. These are a foreshadowing of things to come, but the result or the reality is Messiah. Once again, we see that the feast, Sabbath, and the new moons are all prophetic. They're foreshadowing of things to come. Now, I want to show you something. Let's drop on down to verse 20. Look at verse 20. If you died with Messiah to the basic principles of the world, we're going to go into the same argument that we've seen in Galatians. Why, as though living in the world, Oh, man, do you subject yourself to their rules? Now, Christian, this is going to hurt. This is going to hurt. Why are we coming into the body of Messiah? We're laying down our life. We're taking on Messiah, and we want to still live in the world. We still want to live under the, the standard of the world. We still want to live like the world, and then we cannot understand why we don't see God moving in our life. It won't happen. It can't happen. Look at 4.9 again. But now you have to come to, to, to know God, or rather you have come to be known by God. So how can you turn your back again to those weak and what? Worthless principles. So we see worthless principles here. Back it up again. And we see basic principles of the world. In the Greek, same word. The same word, our worthless word, trying to do the things of the world but do it inside the kingdom. We see this all the time in the body of Messiah. People trying to live a life from the world but do it inside the Messiah, you can't do it. They're in complete odds at each other. Notice here the same language. The matter of fact, the basic principles and worthless principles come from the Greek word, same Greek word. And we all need to notice here is that Paul is consistent throughout. So many miss this that there are different messages or depending on who you are or whatever, right? But it's the consistency with the rest of Scripture. He never misses a beat. He's consistent. And when you and I try to align ourselves with a belief that is not consistent with the entirety of Scripture, you'll be in big trouble as well. 
we, the, the excuse as a believer to say, that's not my job anymore. That's the pastor, the teacher, the prophet, the evangelist. No, that, that went out, man, a few centuries ago when you got Google. No, I'm kidding. It's when you got the Bible. See, back in the day, man, people didn't have the education that we have today where they can read, write, and, and do all. You do. You have no excuse. You're without excuse. Let's continue. Colossians 2.21. Don't handle. Don't taste. Don't touch. Where are we hearing this from? Have we not seen this argument uh, before? Again, Paul is telling these followers not to, uh, is Paul telling these followers not to follow Torah or the feast days? No. Remember, remember that he's coming against the man-made laws associated with the commands of God. There are two laws that we're dealing with. And when you get this in your spirit, you'll understand some of the conversations that Messiah had with the Pharisees. There's the oral law, and then there's the Torah, God's written commandments and God's written law. You get this, it will, whew, it'll change you, man. This is good stuff. The oral law given by men and the Mosaic law given by God, what I mean is pick up a Jewish calendar, pick out a feast or a Sabbath, and look at all the traditions and regulations that they've placed on them. And I want you to remember a phrase that I've picked up as we have learned to follow Torah. And that is this. This is a phrase you need to memorize, right? And let me see where my phrase is. There it is. Where tradition meets Scripture, tradition has to go. I want you to get that in your spirit for a minute because this is what Paul is contending with. And we see it even in the Hebrew movement and the roots of faith, that if you don't do certain things in certain traditions, well, you're not truly a follower. And what we want is the truth of Scripture. Remember, the totality of Scripture and what it says. Now watch. Um, watch what Paul put, watch how Paul puts it in, uh, do we got Leviticus already up there? Do we have Colossians 2.22? Is that not up there? Colossians 2.22? There it is. These all lead to decay with use based on they are a man-made commands and teachings. All right? So, you're either going to be following the commands of men or you're going to follow the commands of God. You cannot do both. We see this in the argument with Jesus, and I'm going to pull up some stuff here in just a moment. But a great example of this, of what I'm talking to you, do you think for a moment that Paul right now is coming against Leviticus 23? Do you think he's teaching against that? No, because that was a commandment given by God, wasn't it? Not by man. What about, what about Leviticus chapter 11 or Numbers chapter 12? Numbers 12, go read it. Focus around verse 28 through 34 or so. Give you a hint. All right. So another great example of this is from the past Sukkot. I want to give you an example of this. And that is the dwelling in Sukkot. How many of y'all celebrated Sukkot this year? Come on. Right? Good. About a third of you did. Wonderful. Now, I want to tell you something. When you begin to celebrate it, there are going to be a group of folks, not everybody, but there's a group of folks out there that if you do not dwell in a sukkah, go camping, whatever. Now, I encourage camping. It's fun. It's a great time to connect with your community. Go do it. But they'll say that you're not truly celebrating Sukkot. Well, me being me, I'm nosy, and I want to know where that is in Scripture. It's in Scripture, but it's not what you think it is. So we know the command to celebrate Sukkot is a command given to us by the Father. Amen? And that that requirement, if you look at Leviticus chapter 23, it will tell you you are to Sabbath the first day. Yes. You are to gather as an assembly. Yes. And then you're to party the rest of the time. And then on the eighth day, what do you do? Sabbath again. That's right. All right? Y'all are keeping up. Now, where in the commandment did you see that you're supposed to stay in a sukkah? Nowhere. It's in there, but it's not for you. Let's look at the verse. Leviticus 23, 42 through 43. I want to give you an example of this, guys. You're to live in a Sukkot for seven days. Oh, okay, see, there we go. No, 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 no. Let's read context. All the native born in Israel are to live in a Sukkot so that your generations may know that I, Ben Adonai Israel, to dwell in Sukkot when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. I'm Adonai, your God. What is he saying? He's saying the native born in Israel. Why? To remind them what the Father did bringing them out of Egypt. Now, if you're native-born and you're here today or online, you better build yourself a little Sukkot because it's commanded to you to do it. But as Gentile followers adopted into Israel, listen to me, you are to celebrate it. It is a command for you and I to celebrate Sukkot. You don't get out of it. But you don't have to do it in a Sukkot. Now, that being said, I want to say something. You can do it. You should do it. 
Why? It just helps you relate with your people, with the people of Israel. It's not commanded, though. We've got to be careful of tradition versus commandment. You understand? You all tracking with me this morning? All right, I'm almost done, I promise. Looks like here I've got about one page left. Don't get caught up in all the traditions that you miss the meaning behind the feast days that Yahweh, your Elohim, has commanded you today. All of us are commanded to keep the feast. All of you are commanded. Listen to me. I'm telling you as your pastor, you are commanded to keep the feast days. You are commanded to honor the, the uh, dietary laws. You are commanded to wear zit zit. These aren't recommendations. These are commandments given to who? Israel. And if you are grafted into Israel, not native-born, but grafted in according to Romans, you have to obey those commands. It's not to be legalistic. It's to be a representative. So people look at you and they see. They know you're different. They know you live a Kodesh life. They know you live holy life. It's not to say, look at me, I'm saved, you're not. No. It's to say you're called out and you're being honored by the Father. You're honoring the Father. Let's look at that Cambridge Bible School thing one more time. I want to read this again. What St. Paul condemns is the observance of the day in a legal spirit in compliance with the minute and childish prohibitions of the Rabionic system and as a matter of merit for God. See, they were doing it because they thought, well, if we did it right and if we didn't miss a beat, then, man, we're, we're, that'll make us a Christian. And Paul does the same thing as he did with circumcision. He comes against them. He said, what are you doing? Your salvation isn't given to you because you celebrated the feast days. They were given to you by faith. We are brought in. That's the true essence of grace is understanding, especially for a Gentile believer. I can't say this enough. When I worship, I, I, just, I, I can't express to the Father enough that me, a Gentile, that he's seen me and he brought me in and allows me to be a part of his eternal family. Man, that is, whoo, man, that's good. Paul condemned the traditions that were passed down. Matthew 15, matter of fact, there's an argument between Messiah. I love this argument between Messiah and the Pharisees. It's these religious leaders. They were watching him, you know. That's what religious people do. They watch you and see if you're going to mess up, right? And they were doing that with Messiah and the disciples. Well, the disciples decided to eat without washing their hands. And what's the first thing these religious people do? Hey, 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 hey. Go read it for yourself, guys. Matthew 15. Hey, they're breaking the traditions of the fathers, the commandments of the fathers. What did Jesus do? I love what Jesus does because Jesus is awesome. He retorts back. He looks at him and says, why are you breaking the, the, the commandments of, the, of God? So they're worried about the commandments of men. Jesus comes back and retorts them, why are you breaking God's commandment? Because there was two commandments. It's the same argument that Messiah was dealing with, that Paul is dealing with in today. Verse 12, Galatians 4, 12. I plead with you, brothers and sisters, become like me. For I became like you. I have done, you have done me no wrong. Do you understand what Paul had to give up? Do you understand what Paul gave up by coming against the, moral, the, the rabbinical law and coming against the traditions of the fathers? He was a Pharisee of Pharisees, man. He was the man. He was legit. Man, he had a, he had a status. And he gave it all up. And he told people, remember why they killed Messiah? You know, there's a Bible verse in there that, that says that the, rabbi, or the, the Pharisees were all gathered together talking, and they're saying, you know what they said? I'm paraphrasing. We need to kill this dude, because if we don't, he's going to bring down all of our traditions. Get this in your spirit today, church. Man, this is powerful. Praise the Lord. Where am I at? What is Paul conveying here? That you must remember Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees. I've already kind of talked that. He knew the traditions. He was circumcised, but what did he do? He gave it all up. He did. Did he give up the commandments of God? No way, because if he did, that goes against Scripture. He wouldn't give up the commandments of God, but he would give up the commandments of men. No way. Paul was reminding the Galatians how he came in. He came in humbly. He said, I became all things to all men. For what reason? To save the least of them. He didn't throw the Torah out. That's ridiculous to even think that. I want to conclude with this. Let's everybody stand to our feet. Hallelujah. Y'all, we serve a good, good father, man.
And when you start looking at Scripture in light of Scripture and what it says, man, you will live. Man, I have not had more joy as a believer and follower of Yeshua than I have now in this season in our life. And the more we learn, the more we grow, this whole, I know this Galatians theory is heavy for some of you. I get that. You're hearing things and you're learning things that maybe and possibly for maybe generations in your life you've never heard before. But it's going to transform you. It's going to help you be everything that God called you to be. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I want to pray for you. Father, right now, in the name of Yeshua, Lord, take these words and speak them into our hearts. And I pray for every person in the sound of my voice, Lord, that they would ask the Ruach HaKadosh how to apply this today into their life, into their walk with you. And I pray that they would have eyes to see and ears to hear that they may live out the life that Messiah Yeshua died for. In the name of Yeshua we pray. Amen. Let's worship.